Do you think one of the, the reasons why uh, producers are attracted to working under your umbrella is, and you've used this phrase in interviews, that you have cinematic ambition? Um, I, think, I think it's a number of factors. I think it's, it's, it's certainly that we've, we've, been very, we've been very successful. We've, we have a good track record in making films that play at the highest level, that feel cinematic and play in Sundance and get theatrical releases and all of that sort of stuff. So I think that appeals to filmmakers. I also think, you know, and yeah, I also think, and I, I, I'm only hesitating because I don't know how it will come across, but the truth is, it's really good fun working with us. I'm not proprietorial. I don't bully people. I don't fight over credits. If someone brings a film to passion that is their film, we become the facilitator to enable them to make their film. Yeah, we take credits, but I would never, ever, ever take a credit that wasn't justified. I would never push someone aside to put, you know, I don't say right, but I have to be for, you know, first place or, pat, you know. I know you've been asked this before, but you had a road to Damascus experience when you first saw uh, When We Were Kings at a time in your life when you were a bit dejected because mm. you'd just done, you produced your first feature, which mm -hmm. was by your own, own expression, rubbish, a disaster. Mm. And prior to that, you'd uh, had a, a history as a publicist. Mm where you had to say good things about Golan Globus and the like. Um, <laughs> yeah. So my, my, my question is, what specifically was it about When We Were Kings? Because I found that film inspiring, and, and not the least of the reasons, maybe because I'm a film buff, I was watching 20 years on yeah. that screen yeah. of struggle. It's a good question. I, it wasn't that for me, although as I was saying to you before, yeah. looking now, if I think about it, that part of it is really remarkable that yeah. it took that long to get it to the screen. I think it was, it was that it struck so many chords for me. Um, you know, I, I thought it was a beautiful film to look at. The archive was just so stunning. And I, I was sort of, I wasn't aware of archive, I wasn't aware of documentary at all, actually. So to be in a cinema in a dark room and watch that 1970s archive with the sort of rich colors and the way it just draws you in and it's sort of so seductive. I absolutely love that. You know, I've always, I'm a sports maniac, and Muhammad Ali is one of the greatest men that ever walked the planet, and just being in his presence was just so inspiring and so fantastic, and he was so, he was just so amazing. I mean, he was always amazing, but at that point in his life, he was, that whole story is so extraordinary, and the, the way he made his way through it, and the dignity and the bravery and all that just so appealed to me. And I'm actually mad about music as well. And of course, the music component of that film is phenomenal. But also, in our, it's sort of music, and it's within the archive, because yep. it was that concert that was going on at the same time. Yep. And all of those elements just sort of weave together, to, and I was just completely transfixed. And it, it, it was a strange moment in my life, because it was, you know, I'm not religious at all, but it was, a, it was divine inspiration. I sat there, and it just, I just got this feeling I really want to do this. this I, I had no idea how to. I didn't know anything about it, but I had a feeling I want to make films like this. And from that moment on, from the second I left that cinema, which was in 1997, I've not done anything but that since then. Unlike yourself, I'm not a, a sports nut, but I love sports documentaries. And most sports documentaries aren't about sport. They're metaphors for life. Sure. Uh, we've got great stories in Australia uh, at the moment here in Melbourne, the Essendon Football yes, Club and drug taking. Yeah. And there, there's drama, controversy, yeah. uh, corruption, all these kind of grand themes that we all experience in our, our daily lives. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yes, you're absolutely right. All of that appeals to me. That's what appeals to me about having sport as a sort of canvas on which to try and mm. tell a story. What you've got to be clever about is figuring out whether that core story has enough to it to be able to open it out in a way that it can play mm -hmm. as a feature doc and can appeal to a wider audience. So for instance, the Essendon story, which I don't know a great deal about, but I know something about, and actually I met with, is it James Hurd, is that his name? Yep. I met with him in London, not about this actually, about six, eight months ago. Um, Actually, rather unfairly, my gut tells me that story on its own doesn't have what it takes to broaden out, but I don't know. My gauge is only my own instinct, and I, I mean, I only have an instinct because I watched movies. All my life I've watched movies because my dad was mad about movies. We were all mad about movies. My brother is in the movie business, and you know, so that's sort of where my instinct comes from, as well as being a publicist for 10 years where for all the 
I started working on Girl in the Globus films. I then worked on Palace Pictures, working title, okay. Miramax, you know, whether it was Wild at Heart or Carlos Sara film or Stop Making Sense or, you know, I got this sort of overview of so many different areas of the marketplace. And, um, and so I bring that to, trying to, to looking at a story and trying to see whether it's got enough ingredients to be able to broaden out like that. And, and, and actually sometimes, you know, we take stories, we, you can take a story that doesn't quite have that and build on it so that you can present it in a way that it does. And although I don't want to be like saying when we should or shouldn't show clips, we could show a clip of Fire and Babylon because that's a case of, in point where yep. it's basically a pretty small story, but we made it as big as we possibly could. And I only, I did it because I'm mad about cricket, all cricket, but West Indian cricket particularly. So given the opportunity to make the film, I wasn't going to say, well, no, I don't want to make it. I just, I, I wanted to make it. And so we had to try and make it as big as we could. Although I'm not sure this clip will, will, will give you a sense of how we managed to do that, but we might as well watch it. Okay, sure. <laughs> Jeff Thompson and Dennis Lilly are the most talked about cricketers in the world. The underlying point is controversy. Controversy about bounces or bumpers, deliberate intimidation, aiming to hit the batsman and bowling bounces at tail enders. Splendid bowling performance then from Jeff Thompson. He bowled really fast today, as indeed he has done throughout this match, and a great psychological boost for him and for the whole of the Australian side. Lily has struck again, another great performance there by Lily. That cricket team decimated every other cricket team around the world. They beat everybody at home and abroad. They nearly killed England. Thompson to Lloyd. And hit badly there that time. I remember the English literally running for cover and begging for mercy. Australia had outstanding fast bowlers. Fast bowlers, and when I say fast bowlers, I'm talking about people who really bowl fast. Not talking about people who just bowl 80, 81 miles an hour. Talking about people who bowl 90, 90 odd miles an hour. Because that extra dimension is whether you can get hurt or not. And that's oh, him on the head, a bad one. The batsman is down. If we get killed, it has happened. It's like a bullet. If there's something in front of it, you could be dead. So take us through uh, one day in September. Um, so I, I, I coming out of the cinema, literally out of the cinema, having seen When We Were Kings, and the next hour I was in my car. I, I, I got in my car and drove around thinking and, and sort of thought to myself, I wonder if I can think of a story that could be told that same way. And in that next hour, out of nowhere, the idea of Munich came into my head. It just did. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'm a mad sports buff. And what I know about Munich is that athletes died. I don't know any of the details. And this, as I said, was in 1997. And I thought to myself, well, if that happened today, and 11 athletes died at the Olympics today, the whole world would be, mm. I mean, the idea that I wouldn't know the details struck me as kind of remarkable. So I thought I'd look into it. I, meant, I spoke to Kevin about it. He was interested. And then we set up upon a development path the BBC, who, who, Kevin knew, who knew Kevin and had probably put some money into some small docs of his, Nick Fraser, gave us a bit of money. And then we started, we started researching and I started trying to find someone who might finance the film. Um, and uh, in those days, we had an organization called British Screen that then became the Film Council. They, they, they were interested and got involved. And, and then a guy called Sandy Lieberson, who's a, a movie producer and a doc producer. Performance. Exactly. And, and Kevin had made a documentary called Total Performance about Donald Camel. Oh. So that was the oh, connection cool. there. Sandy rang me and said, you should call this guy Arthur Cohen. Um, and he, we sat down and he started to say, he said, do you know, do you, is there any archive? Do you know if there's lots of archive? And at that point, I didn't know anything. And I certainly didn't know if there was lots of archive or why it mattered if there was lots of archive. And he kept saying, you've got to have archive, you've got to have archive, you've got to have archive. And I was thinking, why are we talking about archive? Because I'm trying to figure out whether you want to invest, what's your interest, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> He said, you've got to have archive. And then he said, because if you don't have archive, you won't win the Oscar. What's the, the, the climate like today for, for making films uh, on long form subjects? I think maybe it's also a golden, uh, uh, a golden period there as it is for the feature docs. When you, when you say long form, do you mean like Ezra just did? Yeah. You mean OJ Made in America? Yes. Like, well, yeah. I mean, I think 
I, I personally think the sort of the bar has been shifted by Ezra and that extraordinary mm. film that he's made. So, so I think right now, all of those people in the business of financing our films are desperately waiting for what's the next one of them. I think it's a really great time the, to, to be pitching those kind of stories. Mm. I think the risk, well, the risk, I think what people have to be vigilant about is make sure if you're going to do that, it's a film that really generate, to justifies the long format because the OJ story is incredibly dense, incredibly complex and beautifully, beautifully told and works over seven and a half hours. I don't, I mean, there may be many of those stories, I don't know, but I would say be very careful that the one that you pursue is the one that can really last over that distance. What about at the end of the process where you're coming down to deadlines and you've got filmmakers who very much maybe auteurs and, and very much perfectionists and will possibly twinker until the cows come home with the... Yeah, I mean, they the do project. do that. I mean, not all of them. Does that happen? Yes, it does happen. It happens. And some of them, you know, all directors... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that I think directors often, especially when they're relatively early in their careers, find it very hard to let go of a project that you've been on for 18 months, two years longer sometimes. Um, you know, I suppose back in the day, I would have struggled to say forcefully, enough, stop, we're done, you're done, leave it alone. I don't struggle anymore. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, it helps to have someone with experience say to a director, you know, say, it, it's finished, you've got mm. to stop fiddling because actually now you're going to start messing with it. And, you know, that can work, you know, with Malik, you mentioned Malik earlier on Sugar Man, he couldn't stop fiddling, but then when you said, look, Malik, stop fiddling, he was like, okay, I'll stop fiddling. Stephen Riley, who's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant director and editor, he cut, he cut one, um, Listen to Me Marlon, we made three films, Fire and Babylon, Everything or Nothing, and, we, and Listen to Me Marlon, he cut Listen to Me Marlon and did such an incredible job. Getting him to let go of it was harder. Mm. But that's also part of your shtick, if I can use that expression, that uh, uh, on, on your uh, major projects, it's going to be like maybe up to a year in editing. I mean, fine -tuned. Pre preferably not a year, but it's well, certainly... A few months, nine months. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's minimum six, more often eight, and often 10 or 11. Mm. And actually, I mean, I'm sort of related. There's a new film that we're looking at, and... and, and the producer who's brought it to me is really lovely. Has been talking to a director, who said, "You know, I don't edit for more than twenty weeks," and this is an accomplished director up to a point. And I just think any director that goes into a project already knowing that they're not going to cut for more than twenty weeks <laughs> is not someone. I mean, they're welcome to go about making their films that way, but I just don't know how you do that. I mean, maybe, maybe you can cut it in twenty weeks. I suspect you can't. But to know up front that you're not going to give yourself whatever amount of time you need for it to be right, I think is, is a very, it, it tells me that there's, it tells me that the ambition, they don't share the ambition that, that person doesn't share the ambition that I have, which is, mm. I don't want it to go on for a year, but if it has to go on for a year to make it absolutely brilliant, then it's going to go on for a year. Just, just a, a, a general observation, I could be totally wrong on this, uh, uh, that 10 month editing period uh, involves cutting reams of footage together, but that's where maybe the film finds its shape. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate because very occasionally there are films like The Imposter, which we helped Bart mm. Leighton and Dimitri Deganis make, where Bart had such a clear sense of how he wanted to mm. tell the story. It was very tricky in the edit, nonetheless, but it wasn't like we weren't throwing everything up in the air and trying to figure it. It was just how to finesse and mm. execute what Bart really knew he wanted. A lot of the films we make, and I also love this about it, you just plow the footage into the edit and then you get over your head in the weeds in it and you figure it out. And, uh, and often that enables you to discover things about a story that you never knew going in and... Uh, and so, yes, I, I, I definitely subscribe to the this, this sense that you really find the real story and the real creation of it w within the edit. Would Netflix was now been transmitting for about four years. Would, would, would that be, uh, have been maybe uh, paved the way for Amazon, Hulu sure. and the like? For sure. And mm -hmm. CNN just announced that they're 
yeah. going to amp up the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, Netflix is a game changer in many respects. The, difficult, the, the, the problem with, I mean, problem, the, 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 the challenge for the marketplace with the advent of people like Netflix and Amazon is that the, the ABCs of this world and the BBCs mm -hmm. of this world now struggle because what they have to offer me financially versus what, if I do a deal with a broadcaster that takes the TV away from Australia or England, before I know that Netflix do or don't want my film, <laughs> if I've done that deal, Netflix don't want my film. Right. And, the po and more important than that is, unfortunately, the amount of money that those broadcasters can offer me isn't anywhere near what I need to be able to make my film. So, mm -hmm. so the challenge is that there are all sorts of films that I talk to Kate at BBC about that they would love to be involved in that I'm making. And the difficulty is that it's hard for me to commit and I love the BBC particularly because they always backed our films in the early days. But it doesn't, it's, it, it's getting close to a point where it doesn't make business sense to do deals with those broadcasters because it takes too much off the table. The documentaries that we've been discussing that your company produces, they're kind of like more engrossing than novels or uh, fictional films, uh, almost with three-act structures and, and plot reveals that you can't guess. Mm. It's kind of... It's a weird I mean, world, listen, I... I I don't really know, but I, 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 sort of, I sort of feel that for all sorts of reasons, audiences yeah. are more and more attracted to the truth, to real stories, yeah. real people. I think it, I, I, I sort of, although I've got, I think, I've got nothing against the Bourne movies because they're kind of fantastic entertainment. I think generally the standard of movies, I feel, has yeah. been slipping for quite some time. And as the standard of documentaries has been on the rise. I think people are particularly right now fed up with what is truth and what isn't truth or more more than that, the lack of truth in the world in which we live. And so docs which deliver passionate, emotional, authentic honesty, I mean, it's just so life affirming, it's so rewarding and I think and I think that um I think that's what is making docs be more and more impactful and have people more and more... Uh, just to pick up, though, John, given that you've been making documentaries for 20 years, I'm interested to n know whether you've seen a change in the level of budget um, across those documentaries, um, and I guess particularly in the last... Um, <clears throat> probably, you know, five or so years in terms of the, the calibre of the documentaries that really enjoy theatrical success. Because in the Australian marketplace, you know, um, we can make feature documentaries from anywhere for, from, you know, 250000 Australian dollars to, um, you know, somebody making a documentary here for a million dollars has probably got five financing partners in it and, and that's a well-funded documentary in the Australian context. So I'm interested to get that international perspective of, of what, you know, a, a really top theatrical doc costs to make. Well, um, in some respects, I'm, I mean, I can answer that question, but I'm in this sort of absurdly privileged position because of what happened with my first film, which was expensive, but because it was as successful as it was one day in September, it enabled me to just stay there. And so, you know, so I didn't have to then go and try and make a film for 200,000 anythings because we were already at a certain level. If you're asking me what I think it costs to make a proper high-level theatrical feature doc, I mean, obviously, there are exceptions to the rule, but you can't do it for a million dollars. I mean, I'm sure people can, but I can't do it for a million dollars, and I don't do it for a million dollars. I'll do it for a million and a half dollars. And there is an appetite in the international marketplace for those budgets and more for the right stories. But as I said, that's because we cut for 10 months. We spend $250,000 on archive, $200,000 on music, you know, People, no one gets rich making our films, but we make fees and we, you know, I mean, actually, ultimately, if we have to throw our fees into a film because, we're, because we have gone on for an extra year and it isn't there yet, then we'll do that. But ultimately, we're trying to make a living of up to a point. And, you know, you shoot for 20 to 40 days. You need room to breathe. You need time to really bring it all together. 
And I, I, you know, I, I don't. Obviously, there are exceptions to the rule. And when you talk about the Australian docs that have been made, I, I hate to say it because I may be conscious of some of them, but I don't think I'm conscious of many of them. And it's a bit like that person I told you about who, who said they could, they wouldn't edit for more than 20 weeks. That person has made three or four high-profile feature docs, but they haven't really, they haven't properly landed. And if you ask me, that's connected to the fact that their ambition has already limited, they've limited their own ambition by saying, well, I'm going to cut for that amount. That's not how you do this, I don't think. Uh, any good film, as you've been saying, you know, is the universal, the archetypal, it's going to try and appeal to everybody. But just when you talked about Essendon, for example, how much does the rest of the world think of us <laughs> down here uh, uh, any story that might come out of Australia, is it possible that it can still be universal and archetypal, even with the sort of Antipodean um, nowheresville that we tend to occupy? Because, you know, why shouldn't Essendon be as valid as the Miami Dolphins or something? It's a very good question. And, 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 and it's something that I've been asking myself in the three days I've been down here, talking to all these filmmakers who have their ideas, who are struggling to raise money, and in my head I'm thinking, well... What's the chance? Could we? Could is there an international play for this film? And actually, and I may be wrong because I don't know enough about any of them yet. Sort of thinking, I don't think there is. But you're right. It seems wrong. This is a very significant country, and 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 story is story is story. You know, if the Eagle Huntress is a universal story, then why isn't Essendon a? S and it may well be. And I think the truth of that is, you know, the difficulty there is. I think I was going to say the truth is, tell it, and it's brilliant, and it is. The difficulty is where do you get the, I'd say, million and a half dollars to tell it the way it needs to be told in order for the world to go, shit, you've got to go and see that film about this strange team called Ascendant who play in some sport I've never fucking heard of. That's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs>